Hi everyone and welcome back to Learn Neuroradiology. Today we're going to have a lecture on intracranial infections. This lecture is going to be divided into five parts. This is going to be the first part on general principles of imaging intracranial infections. So the overview of this lecture is going to be this first lecture, which talks about general principles. Then we'll move on to talk a little bit about diffuse intracranial infections, a little bit more about focal infections, some special considerations that you might make in patients who are immunocompromised or have HIV, and then we'll have a couple of other special considerations that you might take a look at. So for this lecture, we're going to talk about general principles of imaging intracranial infection. We'll talk about the mainstays of imaging intracranial infection, namely CT and MRI. We'll talk about some of the corollary clinical tests that you might be interested in, including a lumbar puncture and echocardiogram. CT is the mainstay of screening for intracranial infection. It's a way of directly assessing the density of the brain. It's fast and it's easily accessible at the vast majority of hospitals. You don't need a patient who's sedated or really even that still to do uh, the exam. It's a screening exam to look for hemorrhage, herniation, hydrocephalus, edema or mass effect. And uh, so you can see in this CT over here, this is clearly abnormal. You've got a mass and a bunch of abnormal uh, areas. Uh, contrast is rarely going to be useful on CT simply because most patients are going to go on to need MRI and it ends up being not that helpful. MRI, on the other hand, has a number of sequences which might help you. We'll talk a little bit about how these sequences might help you. The first one you want to think about is diffusion weighted imaging or DWI. DWI is a measure of the free proton movement in tissue. Areas that have restricted proton movement appear bright on DWI, and then you have the corollary image, which is the ADC, which is the calculated map. So areas which have truly reduced diffusion are dark. So here you can see an image where there are several areas of reduced diffusion here scattered throughout the brain, bright on DWI and dark on ADC. When you see that, there are only a couple of things to think about. Your differential is namely stroke, uh, blood products, or pus. In this lecture about infection, the main thing we're thinking about is pus. So keep that in mind when you see something bright, a loculated lesion, uh, which is bright. Uh, this, in this case, this is an abscess. ADC, we talk about a lot. It's a calculated value that comes from your diffusion weighted imaging. It reduces a lot of the T2 component to get a true diffusion value. So you're much less likely to see T2 effects or T2 shine through. So when it's dark on the ADC, it truly reflects reduced diffusion. The second major sequence you want to think about on MRI is flare, uh, which is fluid attenuation aversion recovery. So flare is a, essentially a T2 weighted imaging or a type of imaging which is sensitive to water or edema. The special thing about flare is that the CSF has been suppressed. So here you can see an example. The CSF in the ventricles is dark. You don't see CSF in the sulci, and what that does is makes areas of water within the tissue much more conspicuous. So overall, this is a measure of water content. As we mentioned, CSF is suppressed, and things that are hyper-intense seem to be areas of pathology. So edema, swelling, blood products tend to be bright. You also should think about if you see areas of CSF that are not suppressed, you've got to think about whether something else in the CSF either blood or pus could be causing the CSF to not suppress properly. Now, sometimes you're going to see that as artifact, particularly in patients that are on high flow oxygen or are intubated, you'll sometimes see that. And uh, sometimes you can see it if something is wrong with uh, your scanner. If the suppression is a little bit off, you may see incomplete suppression of CSF. T2 is a nice corollary to your flare. So you see this image is the same image from the same patient looks very similar, only the CSF is not suppressed. You're simply seeing the same findings that you would see on flare. Uh, there are a couple of things where T2 can help you. A couple of types of pathology have a characteristic T2 hypointensity, the walls of an abscess, for instance. So these are multiple abscesses in the brain. You can see they have a dark T2 wall here. So that's something that you might, might think about. If you see something with a dark wall, think about abscess. Tuberculosis and lymphoma also have characteristically low intensity on T2, so that can be helpful. 
You'll also see those on flare, but it can be a little bit more conspicuous on your T2. Post contrast imaging is also extremely important in the setting of CNS infection. You want to look at your pre-contrast and your post-contrast imaging together. So here's a pre-contrast image on the left. We have a post-contrast image on the right here from, again, that same patient. The pre-contrast will help you look for things that are intrinsically T1 bright, like blood or calcium. Then you're going to look in your post-contrast to see where are there areas of enhancement. When you have enhancement, that means you have breakdown of blood-brain barrier and accumulation of gadolinium contrast in those areas. So here you can see some areas of abnormal contrast accumulation in the brain here along the periphery of these uh, enhancing lesions. You see another lesion there, and so that makes these lesions much more conspicuous. When you see enhancement, you want to think about, does it fit one of these particular patterns? You can have the mass-like enhancement like you see here. You can also think about leptomeningeal enhancement, which is enhancement which occurs within the soul side along the peel surfaces of the brain. So look for that as a sign of meningitis or direct leptomeningeal involvement by infection. Now let's talk quickly about corollary tests which you might need when evaluating for CNS infection. Lumbar puncture is sampling of the CSF by putting a needle in the thecal sac in the lumbar spine. It's really a key for diagnosing CNS infections. In many patients, it can be challenging to obtain either because of their large body size or many patients with infection uh, may be altered. They may not be able to lay still very well. Uh, so think about that when you're considering doing a lumbar puncture. Now, many times you can have infections and not have positivity on lumbar puncture. That's if you have parenchymal infections or abscesses which are confined to the parenchyma. It may not be positive, or you might see just a mild lymphocytic predominance. Unusual viral infections can also not be positive or have only a mild pleocytosis. If you have a patient who's large or has unusual anatomy, or on whom multiple attempts at landmark or blind lumbar puncture have failed, you might think about doing a lumbar puncture under imaging guidance or asking for your radiologist to help you with that. Uh, these are great indications for that. One thing which you've got to consider when thinking about an image-guided lumbar puncture is whether or not the patient can remain still. If the patient is unable to cooperate for a lumbar puncture on the floor, they're not likely to be able to cooperate in radiology. Here you can see an image of a fluoroscopic image of performing a lumbar puncture. Here you can see the margins of the interlaminar space here. You have the spinous process here. And here's your needle and hub, and you're going right through that interlaminar space into the thecal sac to collect your fluid. Anticoagulation is another major consideration when you're considering doing a lumbar puncture. If someone's platelets are less than 50,000, you definitely have to think about correcting that. If the INR is greater than 1.5, you also want to think about correcting that. Certain anticoagulants also need to be held. Uh, the common ones that you'll see are particularly the low molecular weight heparins or Lovenox. Uh, you need to typically hold those for 12 to 24 hours depending on the dosing. IV heparin is a little bit uh, different because you can turn it off and recheck the PTT and it recovers in about two to four hours. Some oral agents take much longer. Coumadin, you need to come off for about five days. Plavix, you also need to come off for about five to seven days. Aspirin and NSAIDs, while they probably marginally increase the risk, uh, the general recommendation these days is that you don't need to stop from those. There are a number of novel oral anticoagulants, and those all need to be checked individually. If someone's on multi-agent anticoagulation, you have to think about how the risk is increased. Additional risk factors, whether someone has DIC or other risk for anticoagulation or coagulation abnormalities, you definitely want to think about that. This is a list of some of the next generation anticoagulants. There's a huge range. Many of them don't have reversal agents or you have to uh, give FFP or essentially completely replace the plasma. Each of these has a consideration for how long they should be held. And you want to check uh, with your, your local guides. Uh, a lot of hospitals have practices about that. Some societies like Society for Interventional Radiologists and Anesthesia Societies have guides for how long these should be held. Uh, this is just a joke because there's so many of these anticoagulation uh, agents now. They have ridiculous names. Um, anyway, Eloquist, 
Cialis for horses. Finally, the last major thing you have to think about in terms of systemic testing for infection is an echocardiogram. Anytime you suspect a central source of infection, so if a person is bacteremic and has intracranial infection, or you have multiple infarcts in a bilateral distribution, then think about whether there's embolic disease. Now, when you see multiple infarcts in uh, multiple bilateral territories, unless you specifically have a focal abscess, you can't really differentiate septic and bland emboli on the basis of imaging. You have to go by clinical features, such as whether there's a white count, whether blood cultures are positive, and uh, whether the person has other risk factors for infection. That concludes our lecture on general principles of imaging intracranial infection. Be sure to tune in for the next section on diffuse infections.